Good evening, boys and girls, no matter where in the world you might be. Uh, we are hope you are safe, you are sound. Welcome to another live edition of the Highbury Squad. Look at those legends. Let's settle a debate that has ensued on Twitter for a while here tonight. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad. Good evening, boys and girls. Welcome to another Highbury Squad. Many of you will be listening on replay this evening. Lots of football going on, World Cup qualifiers, and many of you probably watching now, praying and hoping that Ronaldo gets kicked out of the World Cup. I, for one, am rooting for him because I'd like to see one more possible round of him and Messi meeting on the biggest stage. My podcast brother from another mother. Welcome back, Mr. Super Kev. Super Kevin Cabell. Uh, oh, squaddies. <laughs> All the best, and at ease, we got uh, we got one of the main guys on tonight. So at ease, and let's go. We certainly do. Don't say we don't spoil you. Last night, Derek Ray. Tonight, this guy, and on Thursday, Liverpool legend Stevie Nicol. But for tonight, we have multi-award-winning broadcaster. You probably know him if you love the fight scene. Um, he is the co-founder of Fight Disciples. You can hear his dulcet tones on the Sports Bar, Talk Sport Friday night, and of course, BT Sport as well. Welcome finally to the show, Mr. Adam Catrell. Thank you so much for having me, so thanks, Kev. This is an absolute honour. You know, we've been talking about this for a bit, so haven't we? You know what I mean? But I'm here now. Here we go. Let's get well, stuck there in. There you go. There you go. Right. Let's get stuck in. <laughs> no time wasted. Let's just get stuck in because Adam and I have had a debate for a mm. quite some time on who is the greatest striker ever in the Premier League. <laughs> now, this is one where maybe stats and data, you know, may lie or don't lie, depending on which side of the fence or which coloured glasses you are looking through. Super Kevin Campbell, one of the greats himself, who's banged in a few goals for a good few teams, including the Arsenal and Everton, uh, has will have his say as well. I looped him into one of our arguments once on Twitter and uh, uh, Super Kev had my back, but here they are. Two legends who mm -hmm. played the game couldn't find the Blackburn Rovers kit. Disgrace. <laughs> Disgraceful. <laughs> too long ago, so it's too too long ago. <laughs> it is, yeah. Probably. <laughs> okay, both Hall of Famers, of course, mm. um, had amazing uh, careers. I think the reason why Arsenal fans, Adam, stand by the argument for Henri is that he played far less games, 258 games versus Shearer's, I think, 434. Uh, Shearer's record, of course, insane. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, 260 goals. Um, Mr yeah. Thierry Henry, 175. I would just hand the floor to you. Based yeah. on the games played, if you were starting a team today, if you were if you were the owner of oh. if you were the good old Jack Walker oh. back in the day, oh. <laughs> who are you buying? <laughs> um, listen, Ke Kev will be able to one hundred percent shed more light on on early Shearer. Right now, I'm a Blackburn Rovers fan for people who don't know. So in 1992, when Jack Walker splashed out 3.3 million quid, a record transfer at the time for a lad called Alan Shearer, who would who hadn't really done it at international level who hadn't done it at Southampton as of yet. He was just taught there's a real hot prospect. When he came to Blackburn Rovers and we saw him within two or three games, in fact, we played Arsenal second game of the season, first home game in the Premier League. He was absolute mustard. He could do everything. And it's not the Shearer that maybe a lot of people watching this remember at the back end of his career. This is a guy pre Double cruciates. He did both his cruciates in that first season. He was rapid. He went past people. Every time he touched it, he seemed to go in the back of the net. And if you just mentioned his overall record there, so right? 260 goals in the Premier League through 440 games or whatever it was. His record at Blackburn in the Premier League, 112 in 136. It is absolute bonkers what that guy did for my club. Now, obviously, that was over, only over three years, four years. Won the Premier League. And he won the Premier League in a team. With all due respect to Thierry, right? He's got Perez passing him the ball. He's got Bergkamp <laughs> passing him the ball. He's got Jungberg doing his thing and Vieira going through the middle, right? My lad's got Jason Wilcox and, 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 
and, and Nicky Mark are giving him the ball, mate. You know what I'm saying? This kid knows that they, just give hey, him the hey, ball hey, and don't, do the rest of it. Rip, don't forget Rippers. Stuart Ripley and Jason Wilcox, I'll tell you they one thing about them two. I'll yeah, tell you yeah. one thing about them two. They were effective at what they done. They could out the feet, beat the out man. the feet, exactly out the feet. Cross it in, Shearer did the rest. Easy work. You knew when it was coming in. So for somebody like Alan Shearer and and Chris Sutton, we got to put Sutton yeah. in there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was yeah. a perfect foil for for Alan Shearer because Alan Shearer was the one who tended to hunt space then because yeah. that's when he could run. Obviously, as you mentioned, because of his his knees, etc. But listen, I understand. And it sounds a bit more flamboyant, Perez and Lundberg and all of this party. <laughs> a bit. I get it, Adam. I get it. But you know, fair play, fair play to Kenny Dalglish for buying the weapons for that yeah. Blackburn team. Jason Wilcox obviously was a homegrown player, but you know what team you had? You had a really good team. Mate, it was a good team. It was a good buzz at that time, and obviously Sheila was the talisman of that. And to be fair to him, when he, do you know something? This argument could be so much easier for me if in '96. When he'd left Blackburn and went to Newcastle, obviously that was a home decision. He wanted to go and play for his hometown club. If he goes to Manchester United at that point, which mm. they wanted him, if he'd have gone mm -hmm. at that point, I honestly think that this wouldn't even be a debate because the guy had gone on to win multiple Premier Leagues, Champions Leagues. He'd have probably scored over 300 goals in a team where Beckham and Giggs are crossing him the ball. You know what I mean? Mm. So Skulls. for him to... Yeah, got for, for him Kicks. for him to do for him to do what he did in a Blackburn and a Newcastle team. No disrespect to either of those sides, but for him to do that in those sides, I think he's absolutely exceptional. But listen, I might, I might, I, I might even concede this because <laughs> as as I look at stats from Thierry, I mean, it, I mean, we're talking about a guy that didn't just do it at Arsenal. He went Barcelona, Barcelona. He's done it everywhere, mate. He's done it absolutely everywhere on the international scene. All right, so no need to show off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just, it's only 411 goals. <laughs> That's a bit mean. It is. And, and if you're looking at the eye test, for a longer period of time, he was a beautiful player to watch, wasn't he? For a longer oh. period of time. In those early years at Blackburn, Shearer did a lot of beautiful things because he had the pace. As he got injured and he kind of changed his game a little bit, became more of a hold-up guy and used his head a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um it maybe was a little bit of a different watch. Henri, for a longer period of time, was just a beautiful, beautiful player to watch. I'm still yeah. back in Shira, though. I'm still back in Shira. That was a fun... Honestly, that was that Blackburn team was a fun team uh, to watch. Um, I'm going to swing back to them real quick. I'm just wondering here, Kev and Adam, if Terence is actually an Arsenal fan. Shira was better than Henri. Wait, it gets better. Rooney was better than Henri. Watch this. Drogba was better than Henri. Etu was better than Henri. I could go on and on. Terence, are you in the wrong podcast? Yeah. Maybe there's a Man United one on tonight or a Barcelona. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're in the right place. So just check yourself, Terence. <laughs> Before you wreck Brilliant. yourself, Terence. Yanis <laughs> <laughs> um, says, don't want to hear about stats. Just watch highlights of both players and you can see what they can do on the ball. Shearer doesn't even come close. Hang on, Yanis, hang Yanis, on. listen, <laughs> right? Just go back to 92-93, that first season... Sheer is gliding past people, man. Even before Henri's out of nappy, son. He was doing the business. <laughs> Trust me. Can I, can I just intervene a little bit? I think sometimes, because this is such a, a, a difficult situ uh, situation to compare, because I think when you look at goal scorer or player, yeah, that's what we're looking at. Henri yeah, I think you're was, right. you know, you look at a goal scorer, Alan Shearer will guarantee you goals. That's for sure. Yeah. At Blackburn, he was younger, obviously fitter, etc. Didn't have to manage his, 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 his body as much. He was flying. He was running over the top. He was, he was dynamic. He was excellent. Also, Kev, on, one of... Yeah, go on, go no, on. go on, finish. No, 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 no. No, 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 go no say no. your piece because it, it might tie in with what I'm Because I think what's underestimated about Shearer is that he actually scored spectacular goals as well. Like, I know yes. Henri gets all the plaudits, and I agree with what Adam's saying. Like, he could score out of nothing. He wasn't just your six yard, eight yard box getting onto the end of the corner. I mean, he scored some screamers in his time. Sorry, Kev, go, go on. Yeah. I, I, I mean, when you, when you look at the type of goals that they score, don't get me wrong. 
Alan Shearer is the record goal scorer, obviously, in, in, in the Premier League. Yeah. And you see the goals that he scored. I mean, he scored some free kicks, belters from 30 yards out. He scored volleys. That celebration. Unbelievable. You know, running away <laughs> at the Gallagher end and all that. And, and well, Adam knows that he's, he's running away at, at Ewood at Park end. doing yeah, yeah, all that. Exactly. <laughs> time and time again. But when we look at some of the goals that Henri scored, these are these are FIFA goals. These are dream yeah. goals that you 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 dream about against some of the best teams as well. So the fact of the matter is, was Alan Shearer as spectacular as Henri? No, he wasn't. That's for sure. No. I think Henri You're... was a, a better all-round player. Yeah, I agree. Why? Because let's be honest, Adam, he wasn't a striker to start with. He was a winger. Yeah. Who got converted? to be a devastating forward and then a striker. Alan Shearer was a number nine from day one. I played with him in the under 21s, etc. We've been we've we've known each other since we were kids. Goal scorer supreme. Bam 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 the, definitely left foot, right foot head. He will score 20, 25 goals a season. So I think that's what you're weighing up. Who's the better player and who's the better goal scorer? I yeah. think I know who the better player is. But when you talk about better goal scorer, I think your bread and butter, people would look at Alan Shearer and think, I'll take Shearer. Because I know what I'm going to get. But I know who the better player is with goals and maybe with assists as well. So, so all round, Henri's definitely the one. But That's goal it. for goal... Oh, Adam, Henry's I'm not. Get, I'm not going to argue with Super Kev. You. Not, yeah, Henri's not getting 175 goals in that Blackburn team. I'm telling you now, sunshine. I tell you, no chance. No <laughs> chance. Terence, Adam's lawyer, Terence, is saying exactly, exactly the same thing. Um, one got, thing I will say, just, just, yeah, on, the, just on the Henri thing. One of she, she, you're right in what you just said. Ke, she has scored unbelievable goals. There's two goals from a from opponents that stand out in my mind at Ewood Park. One is the Letitia goal from was, miles yeah. out, which was unbelievable. Yeah. And the other one, Henri, it's in, it's Paul Shearer, it's in the team where Brad Friedel, I think, is in goal. Henri picks the ball up at left back. He beats and goes down five. the line. And mate, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And then he comes in and then he just bends sick. All one movement, just bends it into the top corner and runs off to the away fans. And I'm like, God, are you taking the mick out of us, man? What are you <laughs> doing? It was unbelievable goal. Unbelievable. And he did that a lot to a lot of teams, you know, uh, throughout his career. Um, one of our favourite, um, our Demian, who does a lot of our Arsenal women stuff with him. Adam is amazing. He loves listening to you on TalkSport. He thinks you should be the host of Drive TalkSport Sports Bar. He said if if Adam could host every show, that would be the best thing. He's Mate, actually just come... <laughs> <laughs> he's actually playing percussion right now for Miley Cyrus in, on her South American tour and oh, taking wicked. time out to to listen. He's a massive fan of yours, yeah. as is our tactical squad guy James Johnston, who just wrote a little bit ago. He loves all your UFC stuff and um, thinks you're an absolute legend and, and stuff. So, That's very yes. kind. You've got yeah. a kind crew here, man. You've got a nice um, little kind crew, haven't you? Kev, we, we have squaddies, actually, considering social and YouTube, our squaddies have self-labeled themselves squaddies, um, yeah. self-promotion. Uh, and yeah, we do have a kind community from all corners of the earth. So it's it's very good, uh, very good indeed. Right, let's get stuck into some other bits and bobs then here. Now we've settled mm -hmm. that debate, which I think ended very cordially and very, <laughs> very, very fairly as well, uh, to say the least. Um, need to get your take, of course, on... Actually, I want to ask you something before we move on to the top four and stuff. Something's mm -hmm. been really bugging me today, and I've been wanting to ask Kev about it, because Kev talks all the time, Adam, and I know that you're a bit old school too, and I want to compare it a little bit to the UFC, because um, you cover that so brilliantly. I mean, Wilder, Fury, McGregor, Rousey. I mean, you've done it all. You've been there, and you've hang out, hang out with them, spoken to them, know their lives, what they've been through. And I was listening to the drive time show today. And it was really bugging me the way, you know, I'll say Goldstein and um, Charlie Austin were defending the criticism of Harry Maguire and how 
you know, modern day players are immune to criticism. We this, Abuse and being a dick is out the window. We're not talking about that. Those people yeah. need to just go home. But when you're talking about criticism and fan criticism, Kev says to me, like, he was cleaning Viv, Viv Anderson's boots. He was cleaning everyone's boots. He had to graft. He had to, couldn't moan. You know, you don't say anything out of line. George Graham would have your guts for garters. Mm. And... It just seems to me like Charlie Austin was moaning about the QPR thing, Tyrone Mings on the on the Harry Maguire thing today. Uh, and, you know, in general, it just feels like they've become a bunch of moany mares. And then compare that to Tyson Fury hitting rock bottom. He's converted me, someone who I who said horrible things about my community many, many years ago, but kind of has come back, fought back, tried to show like I'm a better human being, I can overcome adversity. Can you tell me what you think about that? And especially in comparison to the modern day footballer versus some of the UFC fighters. Yeah, I think I think you're talking about two different types of upbringing into the sport, aren't you? I mean, fighters by nature don't necessarily come from a modicoddle background. It's not necessarily put on the plate for them from a very young age. A lot of these people, for example, you, you mentioned Conor McGregor. We'll use him as probably the most famous in the, in the UFC. We're talking about a guy that was on welfare right up until the point of him making his UFC debut. So therefore, there's real life experience for a lot of people in the fight game. They've actually gone and done normal jobs. They've suffered normal problems. They're going through the majority of things that what we go through on a day-by-day basis. Therefore, there's an appreciation and understanding of, of what that is like in the real world. Whereas, no disrespect to footballers, I would have loved to have been one. But it seems now, and it's, I'm sure it was very different when Kev was, uh, was coming through, now we're talking about guys and girls that are getting signed at five, six, seven years of age. They're assigned to a football club. And if they're really, really good, they're going to be with that football club for a long period of time. And therefore, they're going to be pampered in a way. Everything's going to be done for them. I mean, I know pros that have come out of the game in the 30s and they don't know you know, how to book themselves a doctor's appointment or they don't know how to book themselves various things that you would class as real life situations. And I just think there's a, because they've been sheltered so much, because there's been so much pampering in their in their upbringing through their through their teenage lives and into their professional lives when something does come their way that's adverse and someone does critique them they react in a completely different way than what you would expect a normal human being to react to it's it's like whoa we can't we can't take that i don't know what kev's thoughts are on that but my experience is from fighters because they have that earth mm. earthing let's just say they they're a little bit more understanding of it and they can they can take it a little bit more i feel the same uh, adam to be honest uh, look i know I, I keep getting it i fall foul of a lot of the squaddies at times because of my the way i think P- players have to have a thick skin if you're getting if you're getting criticized and you deserve it you shut your mouth and you get on with it it's that simple and you've got to try and improve your game because you know what, fans would always fans would always back you if you're having a goal. Mm-hmm. But if you're crying and bleating and trying to make excuses, I'm out. And you tend to find that happens a lot more now. Teammates are sticking up for teammate when really has Harry Maguire had a good season? No. no. Is Harry is, is, is Harry Maguire should Harry Maguire be starting for England because of form? No. Mm-hmm. So the criticism that comes with when you're not playing well, you have to hold your hand up and say, do you know what? I ain't playing well. Do you know what I mean? You have to accept it. But they don't want to do that anymore. And this is a real surprise to me. This is what I like what MK said. Leaders don't blame others, they blame themselves. And I think with Gareth Southgate, he's got a trusted group of players that got him to two semifinals. You can, and a, sorry, a semifinal and a final. You can totally understand why he's sticking by them. I'm also of the ilk that form takes you into a tournament with confidence. I think the difference with Sterling going into the Euros versus Maguire now is Sterling didn't seem to be shot of confidence, you know, and I think he's just been at a different level, won a lot of different things versus what Maguire has been able to achieve. So if I kind of switch gears a little bit here, and I think it's the belly aching that I don't like. If I was Mings and the presser today, I said, look, I don't want to talk about that. Let's just talk about the game. Let's talk about football. But mm-hmm. I think this need to defend him, I don't know if the PR team are telling them to do so versus just saying, look, I just want to stick to football questions. Um, I think it's a natural thing, more so, because 
obviously he's come under fire previously. So mm-hmm. when they fire something like that at, at you, I think Tyrell Mings will, will just want to protect him anyway because he's a teammate, he's a friend or whatever. Uh, uh, that bit I get. But do you know what? The press, England should be able to control some of the narrative from the press. Hmm. Because at the end of the day, I don't think he's... The, the fact that Tyron Mings defended him, I'm not surprised by. But the fact of the matter is, whatever they're going to say is they're going to spin it derogatory. It's going to be derogatory. He just shouldn't have to be put in that position. You know, exactly. it's not his It's not his role to defend him. Exactly. Um, so if you want to ask Harry Maguire something, ask Harry Maguire. Don't ask, you know, don't ask me that. But that's how they get a headline. Yes. I digress for just a second. Um, would, <laughs> would, <laughs> uh, would Will Smith them, survive... Like- would, would, Will, would Will Smith survive a punch from Conor McGregor? <laughs> no, absolutely no. not. That is a stinging left hand. If he lands it clean, everybody's going over, even now. Oh. <laughs> Look at that suit. Um, actually, his suit guy, I know him. He's he's actually got his office here, and he's got one in LA in Orange County, David August. He's, uh, yeah. Yeah, he's the guy that did the FU suit. Um, the, yeah, well, they've was, got a line together. They've got uh, August McGregor. They've got the, they've got their own line together now. Yeah, I was working for a brand where they were looking to collaborate, and um, David August was one that that came up. So, okay, Maguire or Benjamin White, Mister Catchall. Well, I'm a little bit disappointed. I've just seen the England team. I watched the first 15 minutes of it, and they've stuck your boy out on the uh, right back, haven't they? And obviously, all this talk about where Harry Maguire's at at this moment. I think it's quite evident, Kev said a moment or two ago, the guy's bang out of form. Um, I think I'm, I've been quite fortunate to have watched Ben when he was at Leeds, obviously playing against my lot, Blackburn, for a long period of time. And he was absolute mustard. He was really, really good. So I'm not surprised that Brighton wanted him back. And I'm not surprised then that Arsenal have shelled out the amount of money uh, in order to bring him on. I thought that at the start of the season, it took him maybe three, four, five games to just to settle into to what he was being asked to do. But now, when I watch him, he looks like a proper modern centre-half. And when I when I say modern centre-half, someone that is OK on the football. I think that's crucial, isn't it? For the type of football that you lot want to play, he's got to be crucial. He's got to be good on the football, not only from a distribution point of view, but he's got to be prepared to actually bring it out into the midfield areas to commit guys when to when games are tight. You want someone from that back line to be able to break lines. And he looked good. Can you say the same thing about Harry Maguire? Right now, no, you can't. There's been moments where Harry Maguire's looked that he can do that, mainly in an England shirt, not a Man United shirt. He looked like he can do that in an England shirt. Um, so if you're asking me to right now, I know this sounds like we're Harry Maguire bashing, doesn't it? You know, And I know that we're on your No, uh, we're not. We're, we're not. We're, 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 uh, we're, we're favouring Arsenal players. But if I was to pick one of those two centre-halves now to go into my team at centre half Ben White would be the choice all day long right now yeah he did quite well at right back the other day Kev when they they shifted they um changed it, yeah. they changed it is that a good thing or a bad thing for for us do you think it matters no, it doesn't matter for us but I think what it does it helps Ben White's England career mm-hmm. because if the manager knows he's flexible enough and can play there then that's another string to his bow whether they play three at the back, five at the back or whatever. Ben White probably has three positions now, so he can play wing back, he can play right back and he can play Mm centre-half. You've got a better chance of getting in the squad with with three three different positions. All right, so let's get to Adam and his take on our picks for the next few games. So, Adam, we do this. um, We pick five games as we go, right? All right. Um, so we started with the Liverpool game. So Kev was on a roll. We had five wins in a row from the previous games. And now we've got the next five. We picked um, a draw against Liverpool. Got a bit unlucky, if we may say so ourselves, okay. until, the, until the second half happened. <laughs> uh, we picked a win against um, Aston Villa. Yeah. Got that right. And we've gone, Kev's gone for a win against Palace. I've gone for a draw. We've both gone for wins against Brighton and we've both gone for wins against Southampton. In our opinion, these are the next three games. We've got to get the nine points with 
Man United, West Ham, Chelsea, the North London derby, Newcastle, Leeds, all coming down the road. What's your take? He's on smiling. The Look at him. He wants us to. <laughs> oh, come on, Adam. Let's hear it. <laughs> oh, is is this is this the conversation about the race for the top four? Yeah. 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 Go on. This it transitions the... into that, of course. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, listen, I've I've looked at your fixtures and I've looked at Spurs' fixtures because. Man United fans watching this, if there are Man United fans watching this, they will think that they're still in this. I genuinely don't think they are. I think Man United will be about five or six points off the team that finishes fifth. So this is between you and Spurs. You know that. It's, pure, it's purely between you two going, in, going for that top four spot. And the way I've worked this out, very similar to what you guys do on a week-by-week -week basis, go through the fixtures, where you're going to get the results and what have you. I actually think over, if we take the North London derby out of it, I think that at the end of all those games, Spurs will be a point ahead of you. <laughs> so Who invited him again? I didn't. Did you so, invite him, Kev? So therefore, what I'm, I'm saying... I'm off. So therefore, what I'm saying is that it's on the North London derby. You win the North London derby, you'll finish fourth. That's where I'm at. So we've said for many weeks that there's a reason they're not scheduling that North London derby yet. Cause they're going to put it near the end of the season. Yeah, That's what they're going to do. Yeah, they of course. They're, they're yeah, then, then, they, know, they know what they're doing. Um, so currently we're three points ahead of Tottenham, four ahead of yeah. United. And you've got what, games in hand, yeah? What have you got? With one, one, game game in hand. Hand. one game in hand. One game, one game, one game, one game, one game in hand. One game in hand. I, I've always thought that not playing the North London derby when Son was injured was going to come back to bite us in the arse. And I really hope that that yeah. isn't the case because Kane and Son seem to have found their groove again. Antonio Conte's yeah. been here before, right? He's he's the manager with the experience. But what do you think of Arteta and the fact that he has got us to fourth? And oh, oh, mate. do you do you think, um, mate? Do you think that this becomes if we don't get it, we've blown it, or if we don't get it, there'll be forgiveness? No, listen, you know what football fans are like? They're, they're bonkers, aren't they? I mean, look at my lot, Blackburn, for example. We, at some point this season, we, were second, in the, we were second in the league. And, we're, okay, we're going backwards a little bit now. There's fans calling for the manager's head if we don't get into the playoffs. Are you taking the mick? If we'd have finished 10th at the start of the season, we'd have all been delighted. So now mm. there's got to be perspective. You've got to understand where you were at the start and where you're at now. If we finished 6th or 7th, that's progression on the season previous. For, for what Arteta's done, from where you were at the start of the season with the criticism that was coming his way, with the way that get, games were going, with the way that they were playing, mm. the way that he has managed this season has been absolutely exceptional. He's got rid of players that were quite obviously bad eggs in your dressing room. He's managed, and we're talking legit players. We're talking people that other people have been snapping your arm off to get their hands on. He's managed to weed, wheedle them out, get rid of them. He's trusted a lot of young guys. And look how you're playing now. That midfield line, the, Martinelli's playing that inside left role. I, it's it's beautiful to watch. And I, I, if you actually analyse Arsenal and Manchester United, where where both of you, both those teams are at right now, Arsenal are in a, a great position of just being able to add to what they've got. You've got young guys only just started out together. They don't look like they're going to be going anywhere anytime soon. If you added to that, perfect. If you look at Man United, they need to blow the whole thing up. It's it's bust. It's a busted flush. That's not going to be competing for the league anytime soon. So I think if it doesn't happen, if you finish fifth, I think that is still a tremendous season for Arsenal and Arteta in this in this period that you're going through right now. And then I think genuinely you can build on that, keep that momentum going to build on that for next season. And then next season, you're obviously then going to be judged on whether you can finish top four. I think yeah. if it doesn't happen this year, I don't think. The, the, it shouldn't. There shouldn't be an outcry. It, I think it would be very unlucky for for it not to happen this year. I actually think you're overachieving right now. If I'm really, really honest. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right, Adam. I think, I think you're fair. right about overachieving. But Adam, here's the here's the thing. When let's 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 put it like Conor McGregor. When Conor McGregor gets that opportunity to be champ, you've got to take it. The opportunity is there. You've got to take it. If you don't take it, that's another. Will I ever get the chance again? So now we are where we are. Ten games to go. Great opportunity. Yeah, there are some tough games, but we've played them already. We've played everybody already. We, we should fear nothing. You know what I mean? So 
I just, I'd be disappointed at fifth. Don't get oh you t- you gave me fifth at the start of the season. I said we'd finish fifth. Yeah. I'd have snapped your hand off. Yeah. But now where we are with ten games to go, it's gonna sting. It's it, it's I, um it's a great opportunity. You you I do you think that you've got a more difficult run in than them? Yeah. Yes. Just well, they've got to the play Liverpool. Name, just yeah. by the name of teams, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. you know what, Adam? I think that will help us. Because the teams we're playing are not just going to sit back and say, you know, come at us, Arsenal. They're going to try and beat us. So that's going to create gaps ourselves. That's what we need. Yeah. I mean, uh, some of our fans, Adam, think that, for example, they're more fearful of the Palace game than the United game. But, you know, yeah. we, we had... I un- completely uh, agree. Are those Is that away from home? Is that at Palace? Yeah. Palace yeah, Monday, it's at Palace. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he's got, you know, Patrick's doing a great job with, with Palace right now, um, really nurturing those young players too. Uh, but for me, I don't want to kind of look, use the rear view mirror syndrome. Is that United game at Old Trafford? Is the Everton game at Goodison going to come back to horribly haunt us? You know, West Ham, is it a good time to play them right now? By the time we play them, it'll be towards the end of end of the month. You know, um, I, 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 I agree with you. And Kevin, I've always said it's between us and Tottenham just because Manchester United are too unpredictable and they play more yeah. like individuals than they do a team. So, yeah. um, okay, so... Listen, let- you, listen, you go to their place and beat them in the North London derby, you're there, aren't you? I, yeah. think, I think that, you know... I what mean, it would be great. Moment, that'll be. What a sweet moment. <laughs> is that, that's going to be worse than watching Liverpool Tottenham in the Champions League final. Is it? Is it going to be I that? didn't watch it, so I'm not interested. I know. I saw, the, I saw <laughs> the penalty go in and I left the house and went for a run. A really <laughs> long run like Forrest yeah. Gump. <laughs> oh, geez. Just kept going and going. That uh, had look, to be the most painful day, Kev and Adam. Oh, my gosh. That, that was so painful. I've got a question for Adam. Adam, of all your yeah. awards, what is your favourite? Ooh. Wow. Um, I forgot to put this up, by the way. There he is. Hey. There's the king. There's the king. <laughs> no wonder he's sticking with his man. Love it, Adam. Look at us. We, look like a, we look like a slim version of the Mitchell you do. brothers there. You do. You, you do. You do. You do. You do. Um, you do. There's, there's two. I think the first one is always the sweetest because it val- it kind of validates your, your belief in yourself and your abilities in yourself. And I think... The first one that Fight Disciples won because that's a product that me and my mate set up, and and for that, our own personal pr- uh, production to to be validated in the in the big old world. There he is, there's Nick. Um, I think that would be those two would be the one. The first ever one that I got as an individual years and years and years ago, just to validate what I'm actually doing with my life, and then uh, the one. <laughs> what are you doing to yourself tonight, man? You're this is this is your out. life. Because <laughs> Adam, look, we could always he's a we always ask you about gate crasher, mate. You know what I mean, mate? Now we're talking. Tell, that's tell the squad he's a little bit about gate crasher because some of them might not know. Well, that's where it all started. Years, <laughs> when I when I was 15, 16 years of age, my dad asked me what I wanted to do with my life. And I, my, my thing was always that I wanted to be like Chris Evans. So when he was yeah. doing Radio 1 Breakfast Show or TFI Friday, I wanted to do the type of programs that he was doing. But obviously, as a 15, 16-year-old kid, I didn't know, didn't know how to do that. So my mum and dad ended up helping me fund some decks. So I started making a few quid at the weekend, DJing at people's parties, and then went into nightclubs in my local town and what have you. And then I just got picked up off this geezer that was in a nightclub that I was DJing at. He asked me to come along and I ended up down the road meeting a few people, ended up becoming resident at Gate Crashers. So that, that was that story, like 18, 19, 20 years of age. That's a madness. Living, <laughs> a, life. Living a great a life, life, Adam. Say Mate, no more. Hey, listen, Amazing. Say no more indeed. Some of them stories need to be locked away, let me tell you. <laughs> I love it. Just brilliant stuff. And then, of course, you end up you know, you're on BT Sport. You guys do yeah. a brilliant job, honestly. And I love Gareth. Gareth I have my man there crushes, is. Gareth A. Davies. I'm telling you, the dude <laughs> is an absolute legend. Um, probably is. wears the best boots in the business. Um, no <laughs> doubt about it, that. You give him a run for his money. You give him a run for his money. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you guys do when, when you're on Talk Sport or whether you're just doing Fight Disciples. So of all these pictures I've put up, all these fighters, maybe there's not one on here. Um, you and Tyson... Um, Wilder, 
Yeah. Um, this is uh, Mohammed, right? Um, here, Mohammed Mokhaev, Yeah, he's, yep. he's going. In my opinion, he's going to go on to become uh, a UFC world champion. This kid, he's unbelievable. His story's phenomenal. He uh, he uh, was a refugee from Dagestan and moved to Wigan, and now he represents Great Britain. It's fantastic, fantastic. That's, a, that's an amazing story. And and Connor, there obviously is. show showman showman type. I mean, you love talking to them all, but who who have been some of your favourites? The, the ones that always stick out for me are the guys that I used to watch when I was a kid. So, like, people ask all the time about the modern guys, like, obviously, Connor and Tyson and, and AJ and people like that. That's more of a job now. Whereas when I got to meet Naz, Nazim Ahmed, she oh, yeah. like that. Because <laughs> when, I, when I was a kid, it was basically Alan Shearer, Noel Gallagher out of Oasis, <laughs> and Prince Nazim Prince Ahmed. Nazim, that was it. Yeah. They, were, they were the heroes, man. So yeah. watching Naz do his thing in the 90s, he was just sensational. So now to be in a position to chat to him just generally, and Naz just, he's still Naz. He's still... He's still crazy, isn't he? He's still mate, crazy. He's, he's bonkers. He's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> just to be around Naz, that, that's that's the one. That um, that whole period in the 90s was so much fun, wasn't it, with Eubank, Ben... Um, mm. Watson, Watson, Collins, yeah. It, it yeah, reminded Collins. me a little bit of the similarly in the te in the sense of you couldn't wait for the fight when it was Hagler, um, Roberto Duran, Hearns. you know, yeah. Thomas the Hitman yeah. Hearns, that, Mark that Barkley, whole, all that lot. There were so that, many. Yeah, Duran. I, yeah. I mean, I love I, talking to fighters. Is fascinating. I mean, uh, I, I said I mentioned to Adam when I worked with Jake Lamotta, I was like, wow, this is. I know he had a bit of a checkered past, but another one like Tyson Fury, Adam, who. When he, when as his life went on and he met his last wife, just completely changed everything about his thinking and you know his beliefs and how he treated people and, but he still felt like he could get in the ring. I mean, the dude was you know still winking at women and <laughs> still thinking he could get in the ring and stuff like that. So still a lot of fight in him. Yeah, I thought I was name dropping with Naz. You've just gone Jake Lamotta on me. You've topped off <laughs> everything. <Fair play. laughs> <laughs> I have to say it was one of those pinch myself moments, I you bet. know. Yeah, okay. it was insane, um, insane. And his wife is a lovely, lovely lady who took care of him and taken care of his legacy and everything about kind of, you know, how his story's been told now too. So it's pretty cool. Right, we're going to get you out on some fun stuff, okay, so we can all go and watch some football. Um, right. How bad do you want Burnley to be relegated? Massively, massively, <laughs> mate. I knew we'd get on to this. Right, I'm going to tell you why they're going down. <laughs> now, listen, I've got a lot of respect for Sean Dyche. I mean, I'm, I'm jealous just with what he's done for them. He's been absolutely, he's been brilliant, hasn't he? Absolutely brilliant. It might not be the necessarily the most attractive football to watch, but it's it's been effective. brilliant for them. It's effective, However, it? right, I've got a lot of mates that are Burnley fans and they've been at me now. They've had, they've had me for about, what, five, six, seven years. I've had enough of it, mate. I've had absolutely, I've had enough of it. If we're not going up this year, that lot are coming down, let me tell yes. you. So come on. Derby, get, get, Derby Day. Bring it back, man. Let's bring back them Derby Days. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but how rewarding would it be? Because as Arsenal fans, of course, the dream is always like, oh, gee, Tottenham relegated, we win the league. Whatever the scenarios are. You you guys could actually still make the playoffs, right? The, yeah. It's right. So once you're yeah. in the playoffs, anything can happen in football. And like Kev always says, you know, when two teams meet, anything anything can happen in those big moments. For them to go down, oh, and you guys on. to even have the chance to be in a playoff to up. come up. Listen, that's... listen, <laughs> tough, right? This is what this is. We're getting Tyson Fury, Dillian White this year. We're hopefully going to get AJ Usyk rematch. We might get a Conor McGregor return. John Jones might come back to the UFC. I'd trade them all in for that that you've just said. <laughs> <laughs> we go up there, come down. Let's go. That's I'm brilliant. Life. That's life. That's life. Yeah. Oh, that's so epic. Well, we're rooting for you, put it that way. Um, you know, teams like Watford, Yo-Yo, Norwich, Yo, yo, agree with you. Sean Dyche has done an amazing job. They're actually playing better football this year, which is shocking. Yeah. You know, I thought that Veghorst will probably save them from from relegation, but but we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. Who ends up going down? Do I hate I've saying got... this. Do Kev's Everton survive? Well, um, Norwich are done, right? So you've got Watford and Burnley. I actually think Burnley will finish above Watford, and I think. 
I think uh, Everton stay up by a point. I'm just looking at I'm just looking at the games to go. I actually think Everton and Leeds will finish on the same amount of points, and it'll be a by a point. Maybe I've just done this because of my rose tinted glasses. Once <laughs> Burnley go down by a smidge, I don't know. But I think Burnley go down by a point. I think Everton will survive just. All right, and... Adam. I've got to say sorry, so. No, you know what? Care. I've just worked this out. Adam wants Burnley to be crying on the last day of the season. Yeah, 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 That's yeah. What he wants. That's it. That's it. He wants his mates in tears. He I does. want them. I want them. I want them to have hope, Kev. That's what it yeah. is. I want them to go into that last day. I want them to think that they're, they're all right. I love football. And then I don't know some mad little thing where you Trap guys door. get seven minutes. Yeah, VAR. You know, seven minutes Could of you time. VAR Your VAR and VAR have been be the best. Oh, my gosh. That's so oh, mean. Man. I love it, though. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Um, also, Adam, just real quick, there's a, a Blackpool. Another, If you had to manage Blackpool or Burnley, Please. but and it had to be a choice, I'm assuming you choose Blackpool over Burnley every yeah. day of the week. I've yeah. no, I've no problem yeah, with Blackpool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, they've, got the, they've, got the, they've got the theme park up there, haven't they? You can have a little bit of fun up there, no problem. Do they still have that <laughs> avalanche ride at that theme park? Mate, they've got it. Listen, it's the Las Vegas of the North, so oh, get yourself, I love get it. yourself brilliant. over. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, real quick before you go, uh, there's a dedication to Tony Parks. Um, 400 oh, appearances, 12 years, 20 plays. Uh, he played 12 years, 22 years at the club, I think yeah. it is. Adam, uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's a couple of years ago. I just wanted to touch on something heartfelt before you left. Uh, Kev is all about, we have two shows um, that we do with Kev where we recognize the people that have come before us. Kev talks about Geordie Armstrong a lot, Pat Rice, Tony Parks, a huge figure, not only at Blackburn, but also had an impact on Blackpool as well. Listen, he is Mr. Blackburn Rovers. I know that a lot of credit will go to Jack Walker whenever you're talking about Mr. Blackburn Rovers. Tony Parks is the guy, as you've just said, player. And when it hits the fan, you find out what people are all about, don't you? When we've lost managers in the past, how many times has he stepped up to be caretaker manager, yep. to steady the ship, to keep us ticking mm -hmm. over, to see him in this situation? I mean, Alzheimer's is, is it's horrific. It's a horrific illness and disease. And obviously you see him every now and again at matches. His daughter brings him along to the matches. And it's so good to see former players just returning to games to, to spend a little bit of time with Tony, have a chat about some memories and various things like that. I mean, we're talking, Shearer's done it, Mike Newell's done it. They've all been back to Ewell Park over the last three to four months just to watch a game with him and, and spend some time with him just to show exactly what he means to Black That's Rovers. Lovely, and, yeah. That's brilliant. And I think there's, there's a dinner coming up in the, in the next six weeks or so where there's, again, very similar to things where former players are coming and people from the town are coming to raise money for the charities that they're raising money for. So, yeah, it, he is he's a real one. He is Mr. Blackman Rovers, no doubt about that. Fantastic. Lovely. Um, OK, so let everyone know where they can find you before we let you go. In my basement, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's it. This is where we're making shows, isn't it? This is where we're churning it out. <laughs> are you still uh, taking your little one to City? You still yeah, going to this? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Kev, this is a nightmare, right? Obviously, he's he's looked at Blackburn. He says, nah, mate, I'm not having any of that. So he's become a City fan. He's been to the spaceship. Has he been to the spaceship? Yeah, he loves it. He can't get enough of it. But my, my little girl's five. She wants to go against her brother. So she's come on board now. She's Rovers, mate. So, she, so we've right. been going on there. Oh. So she's the one who comes to the Rovers games. And he right. makes me take him on to the Game. so yeah we've got a little bit right. of a, oh. she wants to get promoted she wants the promotion so therefore she could go there as an away fan she wants to sit fantastic. in the away end fantastic kev your boy, your two boys grew up arsenal fans no they both support the arsenal no no born in manchester grew up man city fans oh, believe gosh. it or not how'd that happen they said well i say that my had dad's arsenal, a united had fan. arsenal kits as babies Obviously, had Everton kit because I was at Everton. Had City kits. My mate bought them. Jason bought them Man United kits. They, I tell you what, they never even put it on. Wow. They wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even put it on. Because the school they go to, it's either City or United. Yeah. And they've been City. And they were City fans before the money came in. Newman having a go at you. That's poor fatherhood. 
<laughs> Such hey, a shit. <laughs> no, no, man. Let me just tell you this much. You have children, then you, then you'll know. <laughs> hey, listen, my dad's a United fan. My mum's a Stoke City supporter. So how'd that happen? I mean, it's crazy. Hey, and you're an Arsenal fan. And I'm so a there you go. Yeah. Yeah, my brother's a Tottenham fan. Well, it's a mess at our house. It's, it's a total <laughs> mess, Adam. Yeah, totally. Kids have their own well, look, mind. Adam, do you promise to come back to have a little bit more fun with us on another occasion? Because the, the squaddies, the one, number one question they want to know is which footballers would survive in the octagon or if there was a five-a-side and reverse it. So when you come back, we can have a little bit of some fun, fun questions for you and, and do some of that jazz. How about that? 100%. We'll do it when Blackman get promoted and Burnley get relegated. That's <laughs> okay. <problem. laughs> okay. Done and done. Love Thanks so that. much for joining us. Wait, at Fight Disciples, right? Yeah, and, that's right. And if at you, Adam listen, Ketchell. That's right. You know, we're across everything. As you said, you've said it all. We're on BT Sport doing the UFC. Talk Sport, we've got all the boxing and what have you. Come and join us. If you're into it, come and join us and hopefully I'll turn you into becoming a little bit of a fight fan. You will that's not awesome. regret it, kids. Adam, thank you so much. I've got to give it to uh, Kev now, Anna. Yeah, yeah you've totally. Got to give it. There you go. A nice <laughs> salute. Fantastic, Adam. Brilliant. Thanks stuff. for joining us, Adam. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Take Cheers. care. Bye bye. That bye -bye. is the brilliant Adam Catterall, um, multi award winning broadcaster. Top shelf stuff, right, Kev? Top, top, top guy. Absolutely top guy as well. So he, if you could see, he, he's having fun with all, you, all the people he's interviewing, he's having fun with them, isn't he? So that tells you. Yeah, and also he's he's a really good broadcaster. He really knows how to navigate the conversation um, and build a narrative. And uh, he knows a lot about a, a lot of dis uh, different sports and stuff too. So really good. Right, should we go watch some football, Kev? Before we do, mm -hmm. uh, do you have anything to say? Because I only have one thing to share with the squaddies, and that is Freddie's shirt is up for grabs. Thursday is... Um, the deadline so please make sure you go to our friends at footballprizes.co.uk and grab your ticket for those listening on replay um thank you so much for also joining us make sure you check out our good mates at football prizes for the freddie lundberg shirt jags won the tierney shirt <laughs> i didn't know how to break it to everybody i just thought <laughs> Do you know what, Soph? Do you know what, Sophie? I knew, I knew he'd win. But what is wrong with these football prizes? Do they just... They must just give him something. Listen, squaddies, we got we got to buy all the tickets to keep Jags off it. And wouldn't it be funny? He still would win! That's the thing. He'd still win. And here come the reactions, Kev, Matty K. For the love of <laughs> Virginia God. Jags again. <laughs> Oh, jeez. I'm what? telling you, if you are on a flight, I actually think Jags is the black box recorder, Kev. I actually think... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to be sitting next to him on a flight or anywhere, you know, whatever. Just sit next to him at a roulette table. Oh, anyway, so yeah. That guy, listen, fair play to him. He buys his ticket, so he's got an opportunity, doesn't he? That's the thing. He buys his ticket. He's got an opportunity. So, yeah, you might be right. He buys 99% of the tickets. So that's what I'm well, saying, squaddies. Get in. But get your tickets and, 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 and win it. Do you know what I mean? Let's win it. He doesn't win all the just, time, but he just, wins most. Just send him Freddie's shirt. <laughs> that was when he it. told me, I'm like, how am I going to break this to everybody? He just oh. couldn't stop laughing. So... Oh. Uh, Kev, Brilliant. anything else to add this fine Tuesday? No, no, okay. no. Listen, uh, we've had two really good shows, two really, Derek Ray and Adam Catterall, for you squaddies, after a, a little break, which was nice. Don't forget now, Sophie hasn't told you this, but Friday, Sophie, what we're going to do on Friday? So on Friday, uh, as we said last week, Kev put out, Kev says, and he gave you the landscape on the Arteta journey what so would far you do? from his opinion. And, and then the What Would You Do short um, series piece uh, where he asked you about the youngsters and maybe trying to fit them all in together and if we can, how. The response was insane and brilliant. And on Fridays, Kev says, we're going to go through every single one of them. So from both so shows... It's an extended one. It's an extended show. We're going to do a mega show on Friday. So bring your biscuits, 
crikey, all of you. Your digestives, your figurals. If you need a cold, cold, couple of cold ones, bring it with you. Bring your peanuts and your beer or your biscuits and your tea because you're going to get double the Kev on Friday, all right? And it's going to be absolutely brilliant. And he's going to give you new questions as well. We're going to fit that mm-hmm. in too before the Arsenal face Patrick Vieira's Crystal Palace as well. So it's a double, double treat on Friday. You're not going to want to miss it. And of course, on Thursday, we've got the legend that is super, Stevie Nicol, a Liverpool legend. And then you got Kev the legend as well. I mean, what more do you want? I mean, shall I just... What are you? What's up, Kev? Stevie Nicol. I can't wait. Are you already? I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> I love him. You know I love him, Solf. He's a great guy. <laughs> He's so good. But, squaddies, we do have something to discuss with that man, don't we? <laughs> yes, we certainly do. He say, wrote me a little note. I love it. He goes, will you just send me a, a little note Thursday morning? I go, don't you worry. You'll get your note <laughs> yeah, on Wednesday Thursday night, morning, absolutely. Stevie. <laughs> <laughs> They're all ready to go, Kev. Yeah, all right, yeah. um, we're going to go catch some football as well. And um, as I said, you don't want to miss Friday's show. If you can't make any other shows this week, Friday's show is going to be the one where, <laughs> as you know, it's all about you and you have your voice heard. Let's be honest, you have it heard every single night on the Highbury Squad, even if well, you're squad new. Is. That's it, Kev. Let's go. So. Thanks for another great couple of days. Thanks for today. It was brilliant. Squaddies, we love you. Tell the people that you love and like that you love and like them. Don't be afraid and don't be scared. We'll see you tomorrow. I won't be there. Sophie will look after you tomorrow. But I'll see you on Thursday. And squaddies, you know what's next. At ease and enjoy the football. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad.